Hi, I'm Mindy Statter, and I'm going to give a, a brief introduction to self-compassion and why as surgeons, at why as pediatric surgeons, we need this. And again, this is a collaborative effort between the APSA uh, wellness committees and ethics committees. So Lou Marmon and Kurt Heiss in their 2015 JPS article, Improving Surgeon Wellness, the Second Victim Syndrome and Quality of Care, defined the second victim, the healthcare provider involved in an unanticipated adverse patient occurrence who experiences psychological and emotional trauma related to the event. The primary victim or the first victim is the patient and the family and the involved healthcare organization is the third victim. But the second victim, the physician feels fear, guilt, anger, embarrassment, may have an overall loss of confidence and have concerns about continuing to make errors. These collective emotional and psychological effects have been termed the second victim syndrome. So the healthcare organization responds to the adverse event by addressing the needs of the patient and the family. And as the third victim, the healthcare organization is going to evaluate and identify any root causes to, to understand what occurred and why the event happened. And the healthcare organization will recover. But the healthcare organizations have lagged in addressing the emotional and psychological needs of the second victim. So what can we do to address second victim syndrome? We can practice self-compassion. So self-compassion is a resource. It's something we can do to respond to our physical, emotional, and mental pain with compassion. So what's it mean to be self-compassionate? Compassion is the concern for the alleviation of suffering for another. When our friends or our families are struggling, we treat them with kindness, care, and support. But our muscle to be compassionate to others is often more developed than our muscle to be compassionate to ourselves. Think about how we treat ourselves during and after an adverse event. Our emotions can escalate. We go from this is not happening to this is happening to no, I don't want this to happen. I don't want to feel this. I don't want to feel like this. And often we escalate from this is bad to I am bad. Shame is defined as an intensely painful feeling or experience of believing we're flawed and therefore unworthy of acceptance and belonging. Shame is different from guilt. In guilt, we judge our behavior to be wrong. In shame, we feel that our whole self is no good, inadequate, or unworthy. Guilt is I did something bad. Shame is I am bad. Perfectionism can trigger shame in individuals who experience fa failure. And as surgeons, we tend to be perfectionists and are very vulnerable to shame. So when we encounter a negative event, our reactions stem from three distinct sources. The first is the instigating problem and the threat that it poses. The second is our ability to cope with the consequences. And our coping strategies are ingrained and habitual. They're a product of our exposures, our birth order, our upbringing, schools attended, culture, past teachers and coaches. There's very often that harsh inner critic or voice within us. And the third is guilt and blame. And I've already described guilt. It's a, I did something bad, but blame is a way to discharge pain and discomfort. So treating oneself compassionately helps to ameliorate all three of these sources. The three elements of self-compassion are mindfulness, common humanity, and self-kindness. And these three distinct elements interact as a system and all three have to be present in a self-compassionate mindset. So mindfulness, it's the capacity to pay attention to difficult emotions that rising fear, grief, anger, sadness, regret, uncertainty. And we need to accept these feelings non-judgmentally. With the intentional focus of mindfulness, we gain perspective without distortion. Mindfulness refines and clarifies our attention. It helps us to ask ourselves, what do I need right now? The same way that you would ask a struggling family member or friend, what do you need right now? Common humanity. This is the recognition that making a mistake or failing is part of the shared human experience. Self-judgment and self-blame, that harsh inner critic, that harsh inner voice prompts isolation. No one escapes physical, mental, or emotional challenges or hardships. You're not alone. This commonality connects us. Connectedness is inherent to compassion and it fortifies a sense of safety. Self-kindness. We understand kindness, the desire to alleviate suffering, the impulse to help. This is in our DNA as pediatric surgeons. We help the most vulnerable, babies and children. Self-kindness reverses the tendency of self-blame. When we practice self-kindness, we're genuinely good to ourselves. When we recognize that we have failed or made a mistake, self-kindness means that we're understanding and accepting, encouraging ourselves to do better next time. Self-kindness provides the resources to cope with hardship and it makes it more bearable. 
So when we practice self-compassion, we, don't, we do not continue to concentrate on what's causing our pain. We focus on how we're processing the pain. We state that it's difficult. That's mindfulness. I'm not the only one that's experienced this, common humanity. And redirect your attention to something pleasant, rewarding, or mean, meaningful. Express gratitude for some source of joy or goodness in your life before resuming your remaining tasks of the day. And that's self-kindness, genuinely taking care of yourself. As surgeons, we generally believe that being tough on ourselves motivates hard work and is a key component of our success. That inner critic or harsh voice believes that self-compassion will undermine motivation or performance. Self-compassion is not generic positive thinking. It's not a form of self-pity, self-indulgence, complacency, or shirking responsibility. Self-compassion doesn't reduce the drive to persevere through adversity. There remains accountability. Self-compassion helps us revise our conditioned tendencies and habitual patterns for coping. It stifles that harsh inner critic. Self-compassion tempers perfectionism. It helps us take a more balanced view of ourselves. Studies have demonstrated the many benefits of self-compassion. Self-compassion enhances well-being. Self-compassionate people tend to be happier, optimistic, more hopeful, more satisfied with their lives, grateful for what they have, less anxious, depressed, stressed, or fearful. They're less likely to abuse drugs or alcohol or contemplate suicide. They are more emotionally intelligent and can regulate negative emotions more effectively. They're more motivated, conscientious, and take responsibility for themselves. They're more resilient when faced with life challenges and have grit and determination to reach their goals. They're more forgiving and empathic and are able to caretake without burning out. Charles Bosk, the author of Forgive and Remember, observed that the surgeon is held more accountable than other physicians. When the patient of an internist dies, the natural question his colleagues ask is what happened. When the patient of a surgeon dies, his colleagues ask, what did you do? As surgeons, we must acknowledge our vulnerability, that emotion we experience during times of risk, uncertainty, and emotional exposure. By practicing self-compassion, we can turn toward what is hard, a mistake or a failure, and not amplify or distort the challenge, but meet it and put it into perspective. I emphasize we, the common humanity of our pediatric surgery community. We can learn from the experience and care for ourselves. Self-compassion stabilizes our self-worth and gives us the foundation to try again. With the practice of self-compassion, we can approach challenges, mistakes, and failures with equanimity rather than negativity and self-criticism and mitigate the second victim syndrome. If you're interested in, in self-compassion, I recommend um, looking at Kristen Neff's studies. I've used those as a reference. Uh, these include articles, including the five myths of self-compassion and Laurie Cameron's The Power of Self-Compassion. Thank you.